So one of the next pieces in our toolkit is using these uh, stats here that we talked about, the mean and the variation, to actually be able to quantify and measure the amount of um, sort of heredity that's going on in a trait, whether or not that rate, uh, trait is heritable and whether or not there's like a big enough difference in order to breed for it. And this is basically, we're getting into how um, uh, agronomists and breeders have been manipulating the genomes of animals and plants for thousands of years. So, so the idea of heritability is that some of your cows produce more milk than other cows. So if the difference is genetic, what you would do is breed those cows and you would get cows that make more milk and so on and so forth. However, the difference could also be environmental. Maybe those cows are the ones that are grazing in pasture over the hill, and so you should put all your cows over in that um, particular environment. So knowing whether or not a trait is um, very highly genetically based or whether it's very environmentally based is really useful in order to get uh, more production out of your cows or grain or fields or whatever, okay? So in order to change the particular trait you're looking at, you need to understand how it works. So heritability, as we define it, is the proportion of total phenotypic variation that can be attributed to genetic variation. Now here's the key, within a certain population in a particular environment, okay? What happens in your cow herd at your farm over there is not the same thing as what's going to happen in farmer Braxton's cow herd over yonder in that part of the Hobbitshire, okay? the Shire. So I don't even know where I'm going with this. But uh, so we can calculate the heritability of a trait by comparing offspring to their parents. Okay. So if you take, if you have a population that you take a couple parents out of and breed them, look at the offspring of those chosen parents and how it relates back to that overall population you pulled from the whole. Okay. So we have a herd of cows. We have long-tailed cows. And if you breed the longest-tailed cows, just take a few of them, and then you take that children there. Do those children, on average, have much longer tails than the original population? If they do, well, then that trait is, is very highly heritable. If they don't, if it's about the same, then it's probably those long tails were due to the environment and not the parent's genetics. So yes, the trait is strongly heritable. No, the trait is not strongly heritable. We're gonna use um, like strongly or weakly because um, usually there's some sort of connection, like, like a tiny bit. Uh, traits could possibly not be heritable at all. Like who's your parents' favorite sports team, right? You don't get born loving the Cowboys. You are trained by your environment to love the Cowboys, I'm sorry. Um, that trait is not heritable whatsoever. It is completely determined by the environment, okay? So heritability values uh, estimate the genetic contribution to phenotypic variability, okay? So uh, if your heritability estimate is 0.65 for human height, it doesn't mean that your height is 65% due to your genes. It means rather in the population sampled, on average, 65% of the overall variation in height can be explained by genotypic differences between individuals, okay? So 65% of the variation, okay, is explained by having you having a different genotype than someone else, okay? So it's a slight, slight difference there. So for an example here, human height, uh, heritability, which we denote with h squared, little h squared means heritability, is 0.08. Okay, so in a group of people, 80% of the variation for this trait is due to a variation in their genes. That's pretty high, actually. Okay, and then 20% is due to environmental differences there. This particular study was 180,000 people. Bigger is better. Sample size is great. They found 180 different now, not particular genes, but loci, so locations, it may be correlated to a gene or to a group of genes if they're really close together. Remember in linked um, uh, linkage, we talked about linkage groups. So those loci, we're not sure if it's a single gene or like a group of genes working together, but there are 180 different locations in our genome that appear to affect height. And so for each of those alleles, that's all contributing, what is it, 0.03 of a centimeter is um, three, millimeters. Each allele is contributing three millimeters. Um, yep. Okay. 
So that's sort of a broad scale application of human height. So can you breed people to be tall? Well, if heritability is 0.8, and now heritability ranges from 1 to 0 to 1 because it's a ratio, okay? So 0.8 is rather high. You could, in fact, breed humans to be taller. And that wouldn't be very ethical, but, you know, it's possible, genetically speaking. Okay. So this is where we're talking about phenotypic variance. And so the for the height example, that was the uh, variation in the phenotype which we were looking at, which was height. Okay. And so you take a measure, a sample of a population. Okay, you have to limit your claims to the sample. You can uh, sort of like this comes into the big thing where somebody was, um, I remember I was reading a paper, reviewing a paper, and they were like, I sampled three vernal pools in Tully, and I found this claim, and I'm making this claim about New York State. And I was like, well, no, you're making this claim about vernal pools in Tully, and you can't extrapolate that to New York State because you didn't look anywhere else other than Tully. So <laughs> you have to limit your claims to what you actually looked at. Uh, we're going to need to look at the mean and variance of the particular phenotype. So it needs to be quantitative. It needs to be something that we can measure and actually get a mean and a variant on. Okay. And that's, so that's the total phenotypic variance. If we're looking at human population, the total variance there was um, the part of the heritability there. And so it's partitioned into genetic variance and environmental variance. So what that looks like in an equation is that total variance that we looked at, okay, that giant phenotypic variation. We're going to break that down to chunks. So here's our phenotypic variance, okay, VP is our, um, so right here in the population, we've got our genotypic variance, VG, we've got our environmental variance, VE, and then we have this interaction, this genetic by environment interaction. Okay, so uh, what does interaction mean? All right, so real quick, uh, so here in this plot, okay, we've got two varieties of plants and we've got a low soil fertility site and a high soil fertility site. And if we look at this, both plants grow better in the high soil fertility. There is no interaction, okay? It doesn't appear to matter. Over here, when we do have interaction present, one of these varieties actually doesn't improve as much with the high soil fertility as this other variety. There ends up being a crossing of the streams. And in that case, we, this is the interaction. This variety grows way better when you improve the environment. This variety doesn't react the same when you improve the environment, okay? So that's the idea of interaction. Now, there doesn't always need to be a cross for there to be interaction, okay, like a visible X. So here's another example where um, we checked it, like this soil fertility and a slightly better one, we see variety A actually declined, and but it hasn't crossed yet. The idea is eventually these lines are going to cross in the future, and therefore interaction is is indeed happening. Uh, the other idea, you could say instead of a cross, you can think of it whether the lines are parallel, whether or not there is a similar reaction. In this case, the lines are not parallel, so we do have interaction present. That's actually how it, like stat packages and stuff calculate uh, presence of interaction. So just to parse out this equation again, because we're going to be using it a lot, we've got our total variation within the population, okay, our variance, and we're going to take that VP and partition it into our variance that is due to differences in genotypes, and our variance that's due to differences in environment, and that third piece, that interaction between the genotype and the environment, our VG by E, okay, our genotype by environment interaction variance. Okay. And so I might be giving you a bunch of these. The genotypic variance of this population is this, and you know, what proportion is the total phenotypic variance? We could just play with this equation for a bit. So our heritability is based on variation. Uh, is that actually something we can observe and measure, or is our heritability a mathematical model to estimate what's happening? Mm, tough because I've given you like we've made predictions with a Punnett square before and matched them up to observed values. So hmm, what could it be? Well, let's take a look. Okay, broad sense heritability. So this is where we have um, we use a capital H when we talk about broad sense. We're not going to be using it quite as much, but it's there. We overall just oh broad sense heritability is the ratio of the genotypic variance out of the total phenotypic variance. Just like in the human um, example, just how much of the um, genotype uh, is affecting the overall phenotype. Okay, uh, marker off. Okay. 
And again, this is a ratio, so it's going to range from 0 to 1. And very few quantitative traits have super high or super low heritability, broad sense heritability estimates. So this isn't, broad sense heritability isn't super precise, and it's not distinguishing between quantitative trait loci with alleles that act additively as opposed to epistatic effects or dominance effects. It's just sort of rough. It's not parsing out what's going on within the genotypic variance here, which is sort of bloop. Okay. I think I have an example on the next slide. Let's start with a marker and take a look. Ah, and the other thing it's doing is like basically ignoring genotype by uh, environmental variance and just making it negligible. Sort of like in physics, I was like, yeah, I assume wind resistance isn't there. Well, it is. You do have to factor it in, but for the purposes of this, it's, it's ignoring it. Okay. So, can something have broad sense, zero broad sense heritability? Yeah, you know, being a sports fan, you know, it's your parents are going to imprint that on you, but it's not in your DNA, so there is zero genetic component to that. Um, like if we look at people like hair, what hair dye color do you use? That's not heritable either. So, okay, let's do a broad sense heritability uh, question here. We've got two inbred lines of beans. Or in intercross. So that's true breeding inbred. I should probably put true breeding. In the F1, the variance in bean weight is measured at 1.5. So variance again being how far away from the mean. So it's a component of standard deviation. So how different are the variables, right? The F1 is selfed across itself. Uh, in the F2, the variance in bean weight is 6.1. Estimate the broad heritability of bean weight in the F2 population of this experiment. Okay, now our basically our units are variance. All right, so we're just going to go ahead and use that number. Okay, so we cross bean line one, bean line two. Here's our F1, our bean variance is 1.5. Here's the key. Our F1, they're all heterozygotes. They all have the same genotype, right? So technically all variance here is due to um, environmental effects, right? Because if you take two true bean lines and cross them and you get a hybrid, all of those hybrid children have roughly the same genetic component. Okay, so this is where we make the step to assume, okay, all the variation in this population is environmental. And you self-fertilize that and then you get the F2. And what we usually see is we have the F1 is doing one little thing up here and then there's a whole swath of phenotypes that pop out in the F2. Okay, and so our variance is suddenly very large. We've got a big, big difference here. Okay. So now we have our genetic variance and environmental variance there in the thing. And literally all we have to do is we've got our environmental variance was 1.5 because that's what we saw in the F1. We got the environmental, the total phenotypic variance is 6.1 and we literally just subtract the, um, that environmental variance piece. Okay, so this is the VP from the total minus V E equals V G. Yay! We just play with that. Okay? So that's how we get our broad sense heritability. And then we, we have to, sorry, that's our genotypic variance. And then for broad sense heritability, that is V, where's my, let me get a better color, our V G divided by V P. Okay? That gets our ratio. And in this case, it's hidden by my. Um, Thing, so I can't see it. But I'm going to say that that's probably around two thirds ish. Okay. So yeah, uh, it is heritable. That, that particular, you know, heritability worked out a little highly there. We're going to say over 0.5 is high and over below 0.5 is low. Okay. And there's our, I will always give that equation. Hope you know how to use it. Let's do another example. So two inbred lines of sunflowers are intercrossed. In the F1, the variance in flower head weight is measured at 3.5. The F1 is selfed. In the F2, the variance in flower head weight is 7.2. Estimate the broad heritability of flower head weight in the F2 population experiment. So our broad heritability, again, is VG over VP. That's H2. Okay. So we need to figure out what the uh, genotypic variance is there. So we assume the environmental action interaction is the variance at, uh, in the F1. We get our combination there. We figure out our um, variance in the total is 7.2, our VP. Therefore, we subtract the variance. So this is yeah, 7.2 minus, 
wow, that's an interesting two, 3.5, and that gives us the genotypic uh, due to the variance due to genotype there. And then we take our VG, divide by our total. I keep putting the P first, and that gets us our heritability of 0.51. So moderately heritable. Okay. Now, heterosense heritability gets a little more tricky. So this is when we want to look at, we want to break down our genotypic variants and find just the additive. Remember earlier we were talking about how we have um, multiple genes and we have multiple alleles that are all contributing, and those are those additive alleles. We want to parse out what part of the genotypic variance is just due to the additive alleles, okay? We don't want to look at dominance effects and we don't want to look at epistatic effects. So this will give us a more accurate prediction of selection response than broad sense heritability. So if you're breeding cows and stuff, you want to know exactly how many alleles are there that I can cram into one in organism in order to give me this highest milk yield or something like that, okay? Uh, so again, we're going to use this equation, but the next part is we're going to take this VG, okay, and we're going to open that right up, okay? So VG now has three parts. We have the additive variance, a, VA, we have the dominance variance, VD, and the epistatic variance, which is, um, we, I don't know, we use the, the eyes and epistasis in order to give this an eye so we don't confuse it with the environmental variance up here. Okay. Those two are not additive. If something is dominant, it's dominant all the way across. If something is epistatic, it's epistatic all the way across, and it's not contributing to, it has nothing to do with the additive alleles. Okay, so we want to kind of ignore those. So we want only the proportion of phenotype, uh, phenotypic variance due to additive variance for the narrow sense heritability. Okay, so in this case, we want just the VA proportion oh, divided by the total phenotypic variance. Okay. So we're going to use a different uh, sort of equation for this, and we're going to by looking at the means of various populations. So instead of looking at um, the variance of the F1 and variance of the F2, we're actually looking at the difference in means between uh, the various populations. So we're going to have three key means. Remember we're talking about the overall pool, Worst arrow ever, the whole population you're drawing from. And then you pick some of the parents, right? You pick like the long-tailed parents or whatever, that's mean one. And then we've got the mean of the offspring from those selected parents, and that's mean two. Okay. And now the overall formula for finding out the narrow sense heritability here is you subtract the mean of the offspring from the mean of the population. So what was the difference between the offspring and the original group? Divided by the mean of the parents, just the parents you picked, from the mean of the original group, okay? And this also comes, and this is uh, R over S, and we'll talk about what those are again, but this is the basic thing here, okay? So this M1, M2, sorry, the M2 minus M is called the selection response, so it's the degree of response to mating the selected parents, because we're comparing the offspring to the main population. And then the M1 minus M is called the selection differential, also known as S, so the difference between the mean for the whole population and the mean for the population that you chose to breed. Okay, so H2 equals uh, the selection response divided by the selection differential, calculated as so. And so this will give you an estimate of the realized heritability. So you, when you selectively breed and measure the response of the offspring, you can see, well, how, how much of that uh, variation is due to uh, just the additive alleles stacking together via this controlled cross. Okay. So this again, so how do we calculate this again? The mean score for the trait of the offspring you're comparing to the original full population mean score and then just the selected individuals that you chose to breed. So there's our um, little h squared, our narrow sense heritability equals the mean of the offspring minus the original population mean divided by the selected parent trait mean minus the original population mean there. I think we're gonna do a um, practice one right now, okay? So here's a heritability estimate in corn kernels, the diameter of corn kernels, you want big ones, and a population is 20 millimeters, and you want, for some reason, smaller kernels, maybe for popcorn or something. And so you take your original population that has 20, you grab all the parents of this with the smallest corn kernels, and you measure the mean of those, and that turns out to be 13, uh, I'm sorry, 10, 
Okay. And then after you breed those parents together with a really small corn kernels, the offspring have um, an average of 13 uh, millimeter diameter corn kernels. So you did, you did get this, you went from a population of 20, bred the smallest, now you have a population where the mean is 13. And so you get this, so that's where you get our 13 minus 20 over 10 minus 20. And then you get a minus 7 or minus 10. That's fine. It's okay because we're going to just cancel out the differences and you get a narrow sense heritability of 0.7, which is higher than 0.5. So that is quite actually quite a good high heritability for, and then we'd have to refer that back to the question, diameter of corn kernels. Okay. So that looks like a, let me just put a little piece of corn in there. That looks like an absolute, anyway. So that's how we do our uh, narrow sense heritability estimate is with the means of the populations rather than with variance. So let's do another example. Experimental population of flower beetles. Uh, the body length shows a continuous distribution with a mean of six millimeters, but we're gonna grab some big flower beetles. We're gonna grab ones that have body lengths of nine millimeters. We're gonna interbreed those. And then their kids, the, the offspring there, the body lengths of the offspring are 7.2 millimeters. So from these data, calculate the heritability in the narrow sense for body length in this high Inga population. Okay. Solution. So our selection differential, okay, we've got our the offspring, or so actually selection differential is the parent group. So we got the parents minus the total pop is three millimeters. The selection response was the offspring minus the population is 1.2. So you can totally read that. So the heritability in the narrow sense is um, 1.2 divided by three is 0.440%. Okay, so low. Low heritability of body lengths. They did increase but they increase slightly. So um, that's our, it's below 0.5. So we're going to say it's a, a lower heritability there. Okay. So additive variance is really important when you want to select who is going to breed, or if you know, want to know before you embark on a giant breeding journey, whether or not there's any additive alleles for you to stack up in a population. Okay. So there's that response to selection there. You can get that her narrow sense heritability. And this what is also um, brings us to the idea of realized heritability. Is there a potential for even artificially selecting stuff? Is it going to be successful? If I want to breed um, bigger dogs, is there a point at which their skeletons fail and like it's not going to get bigger than this guy's just stop? Great Danes. Okay, so or here's Brassica oleraceae, and that went and got selected for a bunch of different traits. Uh, but can we make Brussels sprouts bigger? Or is there kind of a point at which they are not going to biologically get bigger? Okay. So what H2, again, is remember our, our narrow sense heritability ends up being the slope. Ah, oh, it's between zero and one. It is the regression, the slope of offspring, the response, okay, of offspring to parents. So here's our heritability equals zero. It's a big cluster. There's not really anything going on there, okay? Our heritability equals 0.5. Oh, we're seeing a trend. As the parents are taller, okay, the offspring appear to also get tall, okay? Eh, you know, moderately connected. And if the, uh, if the heritability is very, very high, close to one, oh boy, you breed tall parents, you are going to get tall offspring. Off they go. Very nice, clear correlation there, okay? So this is the idea here. So we've got our potential parents. Remember our, our sort of, you know, M there and our selected parents, M1. We took this group and then we see the offspring here, M2. How far, okay, so this is the difference between the parents in the, the potential population and the parents. How far did the offspring move when you grabbed that group of selected parents, okay? So here's the selection differential and here's the response, okay? And this is why this is end up calling regressing. The offspring are regressing toward the mean of the parent group. So here's one of the longest running artificial selection experiments. Uh, it started in 1896, okay? At the State Agricultural Laboratory in Illinois, over a hundred years. And every cycle, um, they're basically breeding corn for high oil content and for low oil content, okay? With every cycle selection, more of the corn plants accumulate a higher percentage of the additive alleles involved in oil production, okay? And so as they go over time, the narrow sense heritability is decreasing because they are just packing those corn plants more and more full of, of um, oil. So at generation 10, heritability was at about 
0.32. Okay, it's still heritable. Uh, generation 50, your heritability has gone down to 0.1, you know, and it's still remaining pretty low. They're still trying to cram all those alleles in there um, over time, but it's uh, they're running out of oil production alleles to even run into. And the low content has gone basically to zero, like they've able to breed out every allele for oil production so far. So here's a quick question. Why, uh, what is the difference between broad sense heritability and narrow sense heritability? Okay. Is there no environment, uh, assuming no environmental influence on the phenotype applicable to single tree and traits only? Mm -hmm. Uh, broad sense is the measure of the number of genes affecting a trait while, uh, NSH is a measure of genes with major effect. Is it NSH considered additive, not total genes of variance, or it's only applicable to narrow distributions. Narrow sense heritability is considering only the additive part, not the total part of genotypic variance. Okay. That's the key right there. Additive. Okay. <laughs> so heritability tends to be pretty low for quantitative traits. They're essential to survival. Okay. So here's a, here's a list of traits we've got in mice, things like, uh, um, tail length, Cool, that can vary. Body weight is kind of important. Litter size is really super important in terms of fitness, right? So we see the heritability going down because mice are pretty much maximized out how many pups they can have, and uh, that is, that trait is pretty set in stone. Same thing with chickens. Body weight, meh. Egg production, okay, also cool, but egg hatchability, that's important. That is already the natural selection has maxed out things that are really super essential. Same with cattle, you know, birth weight, okay, milk yield, but conception rate, that is not, that has already been super bred. Well, in this case, it was probably humans that bred that, right? Because they have been subject to natural selection over time. Any single heritability estimate only tells you about one population in one environment, a different population somewhere else, has it been bred the same way? Does it the same starting genotype? Is it eating the same grass in the same field at the same latitude? You can only draw conclusions about one small group. Okay. So this is valuable when what you need to do if you're looking at heritability, looking at multiple populations in different environments. Okay. You need to not, what works here, great, that's fine. But can you extrapolate that to other groups and other, um, say cattle herds and other other farms and all oh, the purring we needed this. Okay, same goes for really any experiment. If you're studying tree diameter, okay, you better be doing it in a bunch of different spots in New York State. Okay. Or at least, you know, not just one field in one plot. You know, three plots in the same field, that's getting better. Uh, three plots in three separate fields, even better. Are those three fields in different states? Awesome, because now you're really talking like uh, you can look at differences in latitude, longitude, and figure out what's going on. No, experiment design, very important. Always talk to a statistician before you start an experiment and collecting, collecting your data, because yeah, it's possible to spend a summer collecting all the wrong data. I've seen it happen. Make sure you know what your action, the question you're testing is and whether or not the experiment you're building is going to answer that question. All right. So back to heritability. Even when heritability is high, you can still have a lot of environmental factors that influence traits. So even if you if you can super um, breed for corn diameter, corn kernel diameter, what if your field totally floods, you know, one year? What if you get a terrible drought another year? So the absence of environmental variation of characteristic does not mean that that characteristic doesn't respond to environmental variation. It just means you didn't see it. Okay. So you can still have massive variability, even things that are genotypically um, the same because of just what will happen that particular year.